Hi, uh, my name is Amber Lincoln. I'm a curator here at the British Museum in the Americas section, and I'm currently working on an exhibition about the Arctic, uh, the Circumpolar North. Welcome to my corner. It's a real honor for me to stand in front of this parka. This is a Yupik parka from Western Alaska, from a village called Kipnuk. This parka was made by Louisa Kanuk from Kipnuk. She passed away in 1973, but her son kept her parka that she had made and eventually sold it to Jonathan King, uh, who in, in 1990 was working at the British Museum as a curator. And he traveled to Bethel, Alaska and purchased this parka from her grandson, John Kanuk. Since that time, it's been here at the museum, it's been on display a number of times. It really is kind of a masterpiece and we're, we're so honored to have it in the collection. And I'm really pleased to sort of share some of the, the knowledge about uh, Yupik parkas that I've learned from various seamstresses in Alaska, Elena Charles and other Inupiat seamstresses, Faye Antoazrak, Esther Norton, and Leela Omen. They shared a lot of knowledge with me about the ways of making these kinds of parkas, what they mean, and, and how they were worn. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. These parkas are referred to as fancy parkas. They are worn uh, with a lot of pride. This is your Sunday best. This is what you wear to different seasonal celebrations. For instance, the big fur ronde in Alaska. There are a number of events of dancing, Yupik and Anubiak dancing. So people wear their fanciest clothes to that. I should first tell you a little bit about why these things are worn with such pride. There's a number of reasons, but if we look at the materials that this uh, parka is made from, we start here, this is a rough, we start at the top, the hood. This is really what defines parkas, is these big, these, a uh, hood. This hood in particular is called a sunshine rough. So when this is pulled out, it reminds people of a sunshine. It's made with different kinds of fur, on the inner side, the, the fur that's worn against your skin is wolverine. And people often wear wolverine on their ruffs because wolverine, for, for various reasons, doesn't collect moisture. So it's next to your face, you're breathing, exhaling hot air, which would collect along the, the furs, and it doesn't freeze. If it did freeze, that would be uh, icicles slashing against your face and be very uncomfortable. Now the second fur here is wolf fur, and wolf fur is much longer. And in the deep cold, when it's very windy, when it's very cold, you know, 40 below, the, the ruffs fold out. This long fur from the wolf gets pointed out, creating this really wonderful microclimate right around the face. Your face is perfectly protected, and you it, it even kind of, uh, protects you from that howling wind. It's, uh, you, you're in your nice little uh, quiet bubble. <laughs> so uh, they're really beautiful and they're, they're really comfortable to wear when it's, um, when it's cold and windy. The main body part is made out of ground squirrel. And ground squirrels are these small animals that are all over Alaska. They, they live everywhere, but they are small, and it's basically just the back section that is used for these parkas. So you can imagine how many different ground squirrels this parka is made from. Esther Norton told me that when she made these parkas, it usually took her a hundred or so of these uh, ground squirrel hides. These parkas take an incredible amount of work, as you can imagine. They're sewn by hand, and so if you look on the inside, you can see how even these stitches are. And it was important that these seamstresses took their time, were really deliberate, because if you sewed a hunter, for instance, a parka that fell apart, didn't work, got holes, you could seriously jeopardize that person's life. People forget that one of the most important tools for living in the Arctic is actually the needle, because if you don't have the ability to be warm and mobile, right? 
you could you could just stay in your house, but then of course you can't get out to get food. So if you can't be mobile and warm, uh, you're not going to uh, make it. There's also these beautiful tassels, and these are made from ermine. The trim historically was often made with reindeer hide. And again, in Alaska, there were caribou, basically wild reindeer. Caribou are pretty much one color, kind of a beigey color. But reindeers are much more diverse in color. And so when the Alaska Native seamstresses got hold of reindeer, it was a big deal. And they would trade often in the Russia Far East and with reindeer herders from Chukotka. If they could get a white reindeer, that was really uh, important around the early 20th century. But very soon after that, um, traders and commercial companies came in. People could order calf skin, and then this is, this is calf. If we go down further, the trim here is beaver. And beaver's you know, a, a wonderful fur that has these outer guard hairs. So if you think about how many different furs are in this one coat, for them, part of the pride comes from the fact that they were able to get so many furs, uh, these beautiful, diverse furs. And it, it really means that either the furs were provided for their, by their family or, or husbands or fathers or sons, and it really shows how successful and how uh, what good hunters they were, and that's really important for people. So wearing a garment like this sort of shows the success of one's family. Hunters definitely are important and, and still are highly revered, but at the same time, so are seamstresses. Both work together, right? So one brings in the material, one processes that material, and then gives it back. These incredible works of art are aesthetically beautiful and they have this huge history of, of stories and family connections and family pride. But at the end of the day, they're incredibly functional. And that's, that's also one of their beauties, to put so much effort into something that is so necessary. So thank you all for watching. It's been uh, great to chat about this uh, wonderful object and uh, shout out to my friends uh, and colleagues across the Arctic. Uh, if you want to experience the Arctic here in London, check out this page. <laughs>